clients, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our 2022 State of the Connecticut Nonprofit Sector uh, Survey Webinar. So thank you uh, to everyone for joining us this morning. We've got a jam-packed 60-minute uh, engaging uh, information sharing session. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of logistics uh, for this morning's webinar. Um, the session will be recorded and following the session today, we will be sharing with you the recording, the detailed report, um, as well as the leadership reflections uh, that were undertaken as part of the process. Um, I'm gonna hand it over and do some introductions and welcome our Alliance colleagues, uh, Brunilda and Ben, to talk a little bit about the Alliance to get us started, Brunilda. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Brunilda Ferri. I am Vice President of Programs and Operations with the Alliance. The Alliance is the statewide advocacy association for community nonprofits in Connecticut. So our mission um, essentially is twofold. We provide capacity building opportunities and resources to our members. Um, and we are also the collective voice advocating for community nonprofits at the legislature with the administration and others. Um, and we really truly believe that together we can make much more of an impact than we can as individual agencies. So we work at the Alliance to advocate to develop different strategies and public policies that make it possible for nonprofits to fulfill their missions and that um, together we, we can make change collectively. Thank Thanks. So I'll hand it over to Ben. Ben, good. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ben Shaken. I'm the director of government relations at the Nonprofit Alliance, along with Manilda. I'm actually at the Capitol this morning in person and in a room full of loud lobbyists. So I'll keep my uh, my, in, my introduction short and send it back to Anne. Uh, I'll talk to y'all in a minute. Thanks, Ben. Um, and it's my pleasure to have both uh, Jim and Melissa from FIO Partners with us this morning. Jim, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you. Um, it's amazing that we're sort of having this conversation two years later, almost to the day. Um, but uh, hopefully with the information we're able to share is both affirming and hopefully uplifting uh, for everybody today. Thanks so much. Melissa. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm excited to have you all here today and to share these findings. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to all the members of the FIO and Alliance teams that contributed to this work, um, as well as to all of the leaders who took time to participate in the, in the survey or to uh, do an interview. So thank you all very much. And for those of you not familiar, FIO Partners is a consulting firm based here in Connecticut. Um, we have a wonderful team that actually is based across a number of states at this point. Um, but we really do work with leaders around making better decisions. And so supporting the state and the nonprofit sector here in the state with this survey is really aligned with our core values around how do we use information to support leadership decision making. And so as you each of you kind of explore uh, the findings from the survey, we hope that it's helpful to you uh, in your own work. Um, I'd also like to take a quick moment to thank the foundation, the philanthropic community that has supported this year's survey, uh, the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, the Connecticut Community Foundation, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, the Northwest Connecticut Community Foundation, and the Valley Community Foundation for their support um, in making this year's survey come to fruition. So thanks to you all. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jim to talk about who participated in this year's survey. Jim. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, we were really fortunate to have 267 of you uh, play a role and provide information in this survey. Um, you did so in 20 days. And we know that organizations have been and people have been surveyed a lot and over surveyed and surveyed to death over the last couple of years. So we really do appreciate all of you that uh, spent a couple of minutes, or maybe more than a couple of minutes, to really provide your input. And so today is really about capturing all that data that we sort of did a sprint for and giving back to you kind of what we heard, what we learned, and some of the implications of that. So as we think about who actually responded on the next slide, um, really what we're talking about is uh, a pretty broad cross-section of the state. So you have a sense here of sort of organization size, the sectors re are represented, and again, the geographic coverage of folks' headquarters, uh, but this certainly doesn't speak to all the, all the organizations here and that participated that certainly work in more than one community. Um, as, as you see in the note, as you see in the slide, uh, overall education and children's services are the most common focal areas are shared by small, small and large nonprofits, followed by basic needs. 
Uh, arts and culture uh, and humanities were the top focus of participating small nonprofits. And larger nonprofits strongly represent adult behavioral health, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and housing services. And this really does pretty much reflect the survey results in terms of the composition from the last time we did this survey with all of you in 2020. We also did some uh, asking about leadership um, and overall about 20% of participating executive directors and board chairs identify as black, indigenous or people of color. Smaller nonprofits report slightly more diverse board and executive leadership than larger agencies, but neither group is proportionally representative of the 37% uh, population that is black, indigenous or otherwise people of color. Overall nonprofit staff do seem to reflect the demographics of the people they serve but the board composition of white-led organizations is less likely to be represented. We also, uh, when we looked at disparities across uh, BIPOC-led versus non-BIPOC-led organizations, we also note that about 65% of, of, of the BIPOC-led organizations are smaller as characterized by having budgets under 1 million. Um, and so oftentimes uh, you'll be able to sort of look at the, the small organization results and if we haven't pulled out the BIPOC-related results, you know, more or less they sort of land, most of them land in that small nonprofit experience. And lastly, we did not make a distinction between management and non-management staff in this survey. So I want to turn this over to Ben to sort of provide a high level overview of the critical issues and then uh, we'll carry on from there. Thanks, Jim. Um, good morning again, folks. Uh, if, if you've got issues here, I need to just uh, start throwing it in the chat and I can <clears throat> try to move from my next slide to a place that uh, it's maybe a little bit quieter. So uh, at the Alliance, we work on a number of issues at, uh, at the state capitol in, a, in Washington. And um, this survey really highlighted a number of, of sort of key findings that, that inform our work and that help us understand, you know, sort of the context that we're asking things of, of, the, of the Connecticut General Assembly, of the, the Congress. And, and the first and most important thing I think that we saw in this survey was just how much of a crisis the, the, the workforce shortage in the state is at, and and just uh, and just how difficult it is for nonprofits to uh, to recruit and, and retain employees in this environment. Um, you know, secondly, that is happening, uh, and sort of compounding that that issue is uh, is really a strained uh, system when it comes to service delivery and demand. That your demand for services, nonprofits' demand for services, is up. Um, at the same time that it's being more and more difficult to find people to deliver those services. Um, and, and then finally, this, this sort of dichotomy between the need to increase funding for services. Many of the you know, health and human services are, are largely, if not almost completely funded by government. Um, and that pace of financial relief, just not keeping up with the increase in your costs as, as nonprofit organizations to do business that we are living through a period of um, fairly uh, extreme inflation, especially when it comes to wages in the health and human services sector, um, but just wages generally, and all the other costs that it takes to sort of deliver your services and run your business. And so um, the relief that the government uh, needs to provide needs to keep up with those costs. So um, I will pass things over to Bernilda to talk a little bit in a little bit of detail about some of those findings. Um, and uh, thank you, Tara. There is some background noise in this room and I will try to move to a quieter location. Thanks, Ben. Um, so talking a little bit about the vacancy rate in more detail, um, over that Ben mentioned, overall a fifth of nonprofits report a vacancy rate of about 20 to 29%. And I'll just note that this is an increase um, in the vacancy rate in the nonprofit community from when the Alliance did a separate survey on this issue several months ago in which we found the vacancy rate to be 15%. And so um, I understand the sample size and population is different, but from I, I just wanted to note that it's, it's really interesting to see that it has increased from then. Um, overall, smaller nonprofits are more likely to experience higher vacancy rates, 22% on average of smaller agencies report a vacancy rate of 30% or more. For larger agencies, 43% of them have a vacancy rate between 10 to 19%, and almost a quarter of them have a vacancy rate of anywhere between 20 to 29%, which is really significant. Um, overall, 
nonprofits that provide health and human services, such as intellectual and developmental disability services, adult behavioral health services, or housing services, had the highest uh, workforce vacancy rate among everybody that was um, polled. To contend with some of the shortages, almost half of the larger nonprofits and a quarter of the smaller agencies are increasing hours for existing staff to make up for shortages in other areas of the organization. Some factors that are hindering staff recruitment and retention are, um, are, are included here in this slide. So the first is nonprofits of all, of all sizes are really struggling um, to even get applicants in the door to apply for open positions. And this is, I think, exacerbated by their inability to offer salaries and benefits that compete with other industries outside of the nonprofit workforce, um, the nonprofit sector. As vacancies increase, it leads to current staff being overworked and uh, leads to burnout. Nonprofits do really important work, but it can also be really difficult at times. Some of the leaders that we interviewed as part of this project shared that some of their turnover was due to pressures of the job and what their staff were dealing with also in their personal lives as well. Um, so both of those factors compound staff and add to staff burnout. Next slide, thank you. Um, so not surprisingly, increasing pay for staff is the most common strategies that organizations are using to support recruitment and retention. Almost a quarter of larger agencies are also providing signing on or retention bonuses, and some are offering things like student loan repayment incentives, um, but it was the smaller nonprofits that minimally reported offering these kinds of incentives. Many organizations um, are also providing uh, things like flexibility in terms of the ability to work from home or offering telehealth services. And I'll just note that anecdotally, outside of the survey, what we're hearing in on sort of boots on the ground in the nonprofit community is that even though some may want to offer these recruitment and retention strategies, like increasing pay and benefits and offering some of the um, student loan repayment incentives, um, a lot are unable to do so because doing so would be would mean providing um, or taking funding away from other areas of the organization for which they do not have because they are primarily funded by state services. Um, so I will hand it over um, to Theo now um, to talk about the service delivery system. Awesome, thank you. So compared to before the pandemic, almost half of participating nonprofits report that they're still serving fewer people than before while 21% have returned to pre-pandemic levels and 31% are serving more people than before the pandemic. Not surprising, 73% of larger organizations and 53% of smaller ones report an increase in demand for services. When we saw both an increase in demand and almost half of respondents serving fewer people, it caused us to take a closer look at the data. And we found two competing stories. So for half of the organizations with diminished service delivery, they are in demand, which raises some serious warning signs around organizational decline. For the other half, stable or increasing demand, but fewer people served, indicates that capacity is likely an issue. And when we looked at those organizations, accordingly, a third of them reported vacancy rates of 20% or more, along with putting people on wait lists or turning them away. Next slide. Yes. So only about a quarter of larger nonprofits can comfortably meet service demands, while just over half of small organizations can report the same. 38% of larger agencies are straining to meet demand and 36 can no longer serve everyone who comes to them. 30% have a wait list for services and 6% must deny services with no alternative expectation. And a combined 39% of small nonprofits are straining to meet demand or have wait lists. We know that while you look at this chart, that um, it's important to note that it's not 53% that receive. It, it really speaks to these dollars were not necessarily allocated across the board equitably or equally to each sector. So as we look at these results in terms of revenue revenue trend increases um, over the last three years, uh, it really is sort of sector specific. So uh, 
health and human service organizations in some cases receive some community action programs. Uh, if you were receiving federal grants before, you're more likely to get increases in those federal allocations. If you weren't receiving federal grants before, you might not be receiving more federal grants or any federal grants. Uh, certainly on the charitable side, the sort of middle two columns, um, we saw a couple of tales of, of uh, a couple of different stories here. Um, you know, in part, what we saw were folks that organizations that had strong uh, pre-existing uh, fund development uh, structures uh, certainly seem to do better. At the same time, organizations that were event heavy uh, or event dependent for, for revenue also uh, sort of struggled here a little bit in terms of some of their donations as well. And certainly on the earned income side, um, we saw a lot of folks sort of struggle just because a lot of those activities, unless you're able to pivot them to e-commerce or other ways that didn't involve in person, we really noted that uh, we saw a drop uh, for most folks, 42% of the revenue decreased during that period of time. So again, these these resources were not, uh, these increases were not uh, allocated across the board, uh, equitably across each sector, nor were the decreases. So we definitely see some disparities in terms of what's happening at the sector level um, at this point. The next slide. You know, the, pay the payroll protection program was a bit of a double-edged sword, right? I mean, I think that large organizations that had more than 500 employees, 500 employees couldn't participate. And smaller organizations oftentimes were shut out, locked out, or didn't have sort of the banking relationships or access or bandwidth to pursue those dollars. So only uh, less than two-thirds really were able to access those funds. And smaller organizations, uh, only about half of them were able to access those funds. The state relief funds uh, were really uh, only available to about a third of folks, and those are those really represent federal dollars that were passed through. Uh, and again, we see some real disparity between larger organizations and small organizations in terms of being able to access a lot of these dollars. And so again, sort of how these funds fl uh, flowed out was, was not necessarily uh, equal across the board, sort of where you sat uh, impacted sort of what you received. And certainly, um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, not that small organization is a proxy for BIPOC led organizations, but as you think about two thirds of BIPOC organizations falling in this under $1 million uh, category, you see that they were also a lot more shut out from those resources than larger organizations or white led organizations. On the next slide, what you really see is uh, sort of a, a, not a, a surprising bell curve, right? So the, the plurality of folks are sort of in that stable. Um, and again, this is in a moment of time, moment at, in time, right? And so uh, for the moment, uh, overall, you know, close to 40% or two in five nonprofits are stable. We definitely have some that are on the doing well or doing better than before. But we also have a bunch that are really sort of struggling and about, again, uh, about one third are not yet stable of all nonprofits. And again, this is very sector dependent. Arts organizations, for example, were severely hit because they couldn't bring in audiences. Organizations that had access to federal dollars might have been, um, uh, might have been uh, able to access those dollars. And quite frankly, in the question I see in the chat, doing well is just a, a sense of self-report. Uh, we didn't, I don't think we provided any criteria other than sort of say, how would you best characterize how you're doing financially at the moment? So thank you for your question, Priya. If you go to the next slide, um, we're going to sort of look at this slide and the next slide together, which I know will be hard because we'll be able to look at one at a time. But I want you to sort of take note that that's, that, that dotted line really sort of is that cutoff between where, where the best practice of nonprofits is having six months or more in financial reserves. Um, and so you see a large number of organizations that are below that, you know, that, that have more than six months that are on the bottom part of that chart, which is wonderful. And a lot of those organizations, it seems, have be really benefited from the injections of federal dollars and the federal pass-through dollars. Um, but we also see at the top, 19% um, of BIPOC-led and 20% of larger organizations have less than two months of working capital. Um, very scary situation. You know, the, the, these organizations are, you know, provide major services and are also very close to the community. And so this is a significant area of risk for the sector at this moment, while we see this relative health and probably more relatively healthy than if we had done this survey a year or two ago or three years ago because of the injection of federal dollars in particular. Um, and so, again, this is not really sort of across the board, right? So different sectors are in different places. We haven't shared that data, but that's in the report you'll receive. 
but really we see a real diversity of kind of where folks are. And while we can look at the bottom part of this chart and really sort of say, boy, folks are doing pretty well, we do have a sizable number of organizations that remain on the edge. And if you go to the next slide, um, so as we think about where folks were able to sort of generate resources over the last two years, a lot of it were in these federal supports, ARPA money, CARES Act money, PPP loans, SBA funds, et cetera. And so those are one-time injections of capital, or maybe two times or three times injections of capital, but they're not gonna be there forever. Um, they're not gonna be recurring. Um, and what we see here on this slide is that while one-time revenues may have increased, the ongoing operating expenses that will recur year after year after year are also increasing and sizably as well. Um, so we look at benefit cost increases of between five and 14%, utility cost increases of five to 14%. This is all done before the last three weeks. So we really aren't sure what the impact is gonna be on fuel costs and utility costs going forward. Uh, we certainly see the significant investments in technology. And obviously, as mentioned before by Brunilda, the payroll, right? This, so 80%, 85% of most nonprofits expenses ends up somewhere in terms of benefiting or, or paying for employees in terms of benefits or salaries. And so those are ongoing recurring costs. And we know that the sector is already struggling around having enough staff and are increasingly finding new ways, oftentimes with dollars attached to them, to incentivize uh, retention and or recruitment of employees. So this is a, a really sort of challenging environment. So the prior slide suggests some degree of relative health for a large percentage of the sector, but we do have these storm clouds coming. So if you go to the next slide, what you really see is again, sort of the slide saying it all, right? Um, and, and in some ways, the, um, the calm waters, if you sort of look at that blue green at the bottom of the slide, they look relatively calm, but there's some stuff sort of churning below the surface that we really need to be paying attention to as a sector uh, from a government perspective, uh, from an advocacy, advocacy perspective, from a philanthropic sector perspective in terms of really monitoring the health and well-being of the sector as we see the one-time injections of dollars go away and the ongoing recurring costs continue to eat at organizations' reserves, particularly as they tr strive and struggle to fill positions and meet uh, growing demand for services. Brunilda. I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Yeah, I think I was going to take this one, Jim. So, um, what does that what does that mean in terms of the policy priorities that the alliance is advocating for here at the, at the legislature? Um, you know, first, uh, our 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 big request, our biggest focus in the legislature is advocating for an increase in state funding for nonprofit services. Uh, starting last year, we uh, we released a, a white paper that showed that nonprofits were $461 million behind uh, the rate of inflation. And that was before the period of significant inflation that we've just lived through. And we asked the legislature for a five-year uh, implementation plan, basically to get us back to, uh, back to even. Uh, the legislature did respond last year. There was a 4% increase in funding, uh, you know, very significant and historic increase. But as, as, as we've talked about that, Funding was almost completely, if not entirely, eaten up by uh, by the rate of inflation. For uh, excuse me. Um, so, so that funding increase was uh, was eaten up entirely by the rate of inflation for this year. And and as you'll see on the next couple slides, the reason uh, for this at this point, and our biggest argument in the legislature is that we need this to mitigate the workforce shortage that people. Uh, people have other options in uh, in employment. We are we are in competition as a sector with all sorts of different entities from uh, all across the wage scale, from uh, from Amazon and Target to uh, hospitals and school systems for clinical staff um, to the state to, um, to everything. And so and so we need increases in in resources in order to survive as a sector. Next slide. So um, we asked on the survey, you know, if if we were to get an increase in funding this year, and our ask of the legislature is an eight percent increase this year on top of what they did last year, what what would you do with the dollars essentially? And uh, and what we found, uh, especially for organizations that are over a million dollars, which were um, you know four out of five of them received state funding, that they would fill more positions, that they would. 
uh, they would hire more people and they would serve more people and uh, reduce waiting lists, reopen programs that they had been forced to close for budgetary reasons. And so that's kind of exactly what, what I think we want to see when we are looking to make sure that the things that we're advocating for reflect the needs of the nonprofit sector, that, um, that, that they solve the problems. If they were to happen, they would solve the problems or some of the problems at least that folks have identified in, uh, in running their organizations. Uh, next slide. And, um, and when we ask people specific to the workforce uh, shortage, what would be the most helpful policy solution? Um, you know, also very importantly, seeing the, the full agreement here that adding permanent funding to increase staff salaries is by far and away the most important uh, the most important policy that could happen. We often hear from policymakers um, a, a lot of a lot of sort of uh, thoughts and, and ideas about ways to, uh, to increase the, the supply side, if you will, ways to, uh, to increase to do sort of quote unquote workforce development and more training and, and other things like that. And um, while all of those are good ideas, I think this data really shows that. Um, as far as nonprofits are concerned, and those who have been trying to recruit and retain employees over the last several years through the pandemic are concerned that um, you know the most important things on this list are things that would provide sort of direct financial um, support to their employees. So uh, additional funding to increase staff salaries being most important, as well as for larger organizations, a student loan repayment program for folks in the nonprofit workforce. Again, a program that would provide sort of direct funding for. Uh, for nonprofit staff. And Ben, we're going to hand it back to Melissa. Thank you. So in 2020, when we asked about the top professional development priorities, DEI was the first and racial justice was third. And the results of setting these areas as top priorities in 2020 is reflected in the work that has been done over the past 18 months or so. So that's what you're seeing here, uh, just a tremendous amount of effort that has been you know, put in by organizations and their leaders in this area, and it's awesome. So more than 70% have incorporated equity into their mission, vision, or value statements. You see them engaging clients and providing feedback and strategic input into their work. They're working on diversifying their boards. They've developed more equitable program policies and hiring practices, and have invested in DEI or racial equity professional learning opportunities for their staff. So across all organizations, organizational commitment and dialogue was the top area where demonstrable change has been observed. Changes in program development and organizational culture were also in the top five for both smaller and larger agencies. Smaller organizations have seen more demonstrable change in their community partnerships and outreach and recruitment, whereas larger agencies have seen more change related to staff diversity and strategy development. And in the additional comments, several organizations mentioned increasing board diversity or composition as an area of change. Meanwhile, board trainings on DEI or racial equity is the top activity that organizations plan to take on in 2022. So Jim. So, so this is where all of you as leaders are able to say, I'm not alone. Right. This is these are the collective challenges that many, many of you are experiencing and you are not alone in those challenges. Right. You're not alone in that experience. And so hopefully, uh, you know, particularly as we've been all sort of separate and on the, in these boxes over the last two years, um, you know, hopefully, you know, you've been able to sort of connect with your leader colleagues around the region uh, in your sector. Um, but if you haven't uh, or maybe if you have, this is really sort of uh, sort of a reminder that we're all in this together. Um, and so as you look at these top leadership challenges, um, I'll just sort of mention that larger organizations reported much higher concern around staffing shortages and staff burnout than smaller agencies. And larger organizations also sort of raise the issue of state funding as, as a leadership challenge as well, more so than smaller organizations, most likely a function of the fact that large organizations may be more likely to receive state funding than smaller organizations. At the same time, smaller organizations express greater concern about maintaining board engagement. 32% of the smaller agencies reference board engagement as a top leadership challenge. Only 16% of, of larger organizations reference the same. And lastly, more than a third of, of smaller and larger organization leaders also feel challenged to align with shifting funder priorities. 
there's been a lot of moving parts over the last couple of years. Funders, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic sort of reduced their restrictions and became much more flexible. And as time has gone on, things have shifted and pivoted to other issues and topics. And so really sort of helping, you know, aligning funder priorities with sort of the capacity and bandwidth of leader organizational leaders and, and the work that organizations are doing continues to be a, a need and a, and a challenge. Uh, as we pivot to the next slide, I do want to encourage folks as we come to the end of our formal presentation to really use the chat to offer questions, comments, et cetera, so that we can kind of flag them when we're done. Maybe a little hard to open up the mic to 150 or so of you um, to, to do a verbal Q&A, but really want, to, really want to encourage you to put your questions in the chat um, as to the substance or other aspects or other comments that you might have about what you've heard today and what you're experiencing out in the community. As we look at these uh, top activities, I, I wanted to sort of note, um, and when we did this survey in 2020, um, top anticipated activities in, at that point were new and adapted program development, risk management assessment and planning for reopening, program policy and procedure development, and DEI uh, and inclusion initi de &I, uh, initiatives. So, what we are seeing here is a beginning to shift, right, from how do we reopen? How do we stay safe? How do we deal with the policies and procedures as we think about people coming back to work? To more of this issue of, of planning, where are we going? Where are we gonna drive impact? How do we keep our board engaged and supported? And again, how do we continue to provide new programs and develop new services and continue to position ourselves in the market and the community? And certainly DEI, racial equity initiatives remain as the top priority still in 2022. And on the right side, you, you begin to see some of the where consulting supports are needed. Um, this is where you may be asking for, for uh, your, our foundation partners for funds. This is maybe where you are looking for other sorts of resources and expertise internally and externally to really sort of drive organizational change and organizational impact. Uh, of note, uh, and we saw this last time as well, is that uh, two thirds of organizations will be conducting succession planning and between 20 and 25% anticipate conducting an executive search within the next three to six months. So this has some significant implications for institutional knowledge in the sector. It has a, a, an experience. Um, it, it suggests that there could be a significant shift in the leaders that comprise our organizations, uh, both in terms of experiences, skills, talents, demographics, et cetera. So it's both an exciting, potentially a scary time, not only for organizations that are going through this process, but for the sector as a whole, that may see a seismic shift in who are leading the organizations that are driving change and impact in our communities. Melissa. Awesome. So to give context to the data we gathered through the survey, um, Cynthia Rojas from FIO Partners interviewed 17 executive directors about their experiences leading through the pandemic. So, you know, thank you to Cynthia and to those leaders for sharing their stories about what it was like. And they provide a great context to the data throughout the report. So I'm excited for you to see the full report so you can, you can glean some more of those stories. Um, but to give a little synopsis of what it is that those leaders shared with Cynthia, you know, they had to adjust their styles during the pandemic. Due to the degree of disruption, strategic leaders often had to get more involved in operations, Meanwhile, more tactical leaders had to step back and become more strategic and adaptive in their thinking. And those shifts are going to have longer term implications for their organizations and the way those leaders continue to lead. Um, technology, of course, was an essential investment during the pandemic. We saw the, the amount that organizations invested in technology resources. And that shift was easier for some organizations than others. Um, those that kind of had the orientation and the capacity already in place, you know, were able to pivot more quickly to those virtual environments than some organizations that had to build that infrastructure and train their staff and their board and their clients on how to use the technology. Um, in order to keep moving. Um, but technology isn't going anywhere. Uh, it will continue to play a larger role in service delivery and our way of work. Um, you know, as we saw, a third of organizations are still allowing for uh, hybrid work, remote work, telehealth, things like that. So that will continue to be something that affects the way that we do business and our way of work moving forward. And regarding work, several leaders we interviewed shared that turnover 
was often due to reasons outside of compensation. You know, Jim mentioned earlier and uh, Bernilda mentioned earlier that the work is hard and that the reasons for, you know, stepping out of the work often had to do with personal issues as well. The pressures of the job, having to take care of little ones at home who weren't in school or in daycare. Um, and people had many stressors in their lives contributing to those decisions. Leaders attempted to mitigate the great resignation by providing retention bonuses or giving raises beyond an annual raise. So the stories that we heard really reflected what we saw in the, in the data and humanized them. And of course, burnout was affecting everyone, even leaders. Being in crisis mode for so long is wearing leaders down. And in the survey data, we see that show up in a fifth of organizations planning to do an executive search within the next six months or so. Um, that is very similar to the results that we saw in our 2020 survey. And you know, luckily you are also seeing that uh, nearly two thirds of organizations will be conducting succession planning. So organizations are preparing themselves for transitions at the leadership level. And then we just discussed um, DEI efforts. And again, those interviews really showed that DEI has been heavily considered. Um, it's been a critical part of the work over the last two years. Um, it's been pursued and it will continue to guide uh, the sector's internal and external efforts for a very long time to come. Thanks so much to our presenters to sharing the kind of key findings from the survey. Um, I'm gonna lean it over to Zoe from the Alliance to help us kind of raise up some questions uh, from the chat. Zoe. Hi, Anne, thank you. So um, from Jackie, um, I think Jim may have answered her question, but um, on the topic of staffing shortages, can you share if anyone reported having a vaccine mandate as being a barrier for recruitment? I dropped in the chat that 32% um, said it was somewhat affecting 29% um, that uh, childcare access was a was a was an was a somewhat affecting factor. But those were the to two lowest uh, rated factors that were impacting staff recruitment retention. So again, probably sector specific um, would be my guess in terms of healthcare requirements versus non healthcare organizations, but it really would depend. But of, of all the barriers or all the challenges, it's low on the list. If the state were to increase funding to nonprofits, would this money go only to those organizations currently receiving state funding? That's from Sarah. Um, I, I can tackle that. The, the, <clears throat> the answer to that is it, the, the sort of mechanism by which the state generally increases funding is, a, is an increase over uh, the current contracts that they provide. And so to the extent that those contracts are, are sort of set today, the, the increase would apply to those contracts. The state obviously regularly reprocures uh, contracts on a, on a regular schedule. And so um, as that funding is annualized into, into what those programs are, are, uh, are funded at, the sort of next time that those contracts would go up to bid or anything like that, the, the increased funding would be reflected in the rates that the state was offering to pay for services. All right, the next question we have is, um, what are the next steps for using this, this information? Um, can you talk about how we're gonna use it in our legislative efforts or um, anywhere else? I'll start with legislative efforts and, and then maybe Theo can sort of pop in with how they think nonprofits might use this information or foundations might use this information. Um, from a legislative perspective, you know, this, as Brunilda said at the beginning of, of the presentation, you know, these findings are, are, are really important and interesting to us because we conducted a similar, smaller survey several months ago uh, and, and, uh, and to, to see the results of, of those efforts sort of validated with a much, much, a survey with a much, much larger and broader sample, um, you know, I think really continues to inform our uh, our advocacy. And so we're planning on doing some publicity around this, this survey, um, trying to get it in the hands of legislators. There's a report that will accompany it um, that includes a lot of detail and is, is really interesting. Um, and, uh, and it'll dovetail in very nicely, I think, with a number of the other advocacy efforts that we have planned over the remaining course of the legislative session, uh, in, including some uh, some work that we have in the field right now, uh, sort of polling the public's opinion about the works that nonprofits do. And um, and other sort of advocacy efforts of the capital. So definitely, 
uh, definitely planning on, on getting this out into more hands from the folks that are on this webinar and not just, you know, a survey for nonprofits, but making sure that um, that others, policymakers, et cetera, see it. Great, thanks, Ben. Oh, Anne, do you wanna share with, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak a little bit to kind of how I think the data can be helpful to both nonprofits and to funders. And the nonprofit side, I mean, I think part of this is validating your own experience. Um, as Jim said, leaders can very often, as we've navigated these difficult two years, sort of be like, well, I'm the only one this is happening to. And so I hope as you sort of lean into the data, there's some reassurance that there's sort of collective both challenges and opportunities. Um, and that in so many ways, leaders have, you know, kind of the scaffolding that they need to continue to navigate what lies ahead. And I think that leans into kind of really the funder use of the data, which is how are we investing in capacity building? What are the types of programs that are being run across the state to support nonprofits to address these challenges? I think in terms of capacity building strategy at the state level, it's really thinking about what are some of the common challenges that nonprofits are facing and how can we as kind of a collective, both philanthropic and capacity building community really address these needs. So I think the data has both the legislative impacts, but it also helps us think about as both capacity builders and funders, you know, what are the types of activities that we need to invest in over the next 18 months to two years? Thank you. All right, the next question is from Carla. Um, you reported trends in funding concerns by organization size. Did you see any other trends like um, by issue focus or region? Short answer is we haven't sliced the data that way. It's a great question. So um, we can and we will. I think the region part is hard because we have organizations that are headquartered in one but but serve multiple, but we can certainly look at the uh, question of by sector. I also want to sort of add uh, uh, add on to what Anne was saying in terms of sort of uh, sort of how we think about this moving forward in terms of the sector. One thing that we didn't ask about um, is sort of the collective experience of trauma that the sector has experienced over the last couple of years. You know, the impact of burnout, the impact of loss, um, the impact of not being able to serve, the impact of uncertainty. Um, in our personal and professional lives and as organizational leaders. And so I think that's one area that we didn't capture in this survey, but I think we're going we're gonna to be really interested looking forward to really understand uh, as we see a, a mental health crisis affecting our kids and families across the nation uh, as individuals, you know, that translates and, and experience also occurs within organizations. And I think it'll be important for all of us to really understand um, what, a, what, are, what does it mean to be trauma informed as it relates to our nonprofit sector moving forward? All right, did you, this is from Betsy. Um, did you receive any feedback from the nonprofit sector on reduced need for services as a result of federal funding to school districts and municipalities? School Melissa, I don't think we did, do we? No, not anything pertaining to school districts and, and municipalities, no. All right, um, this one is from Ree. Is the Alliance doing anything to support the CT Humanities, CT Office of the Arts in securing ongoing funding that they used so successfully for regranting to arts and cultural organizations earlier this year? Funding was especially valuable to organizations that don't receive other types of state funding. Uh, yes, we, we are supporting the different legislative proposals here that relate to funding for arts and cultural programs. In addition, um, in many of those programs are funded through the Department of Economic and Community Development with sort of small grant funding, some of which is through a competitive bidding process, um, which is what you're referring, referring to, Re, and some of which is kind of through earmarks, basically, that go to individual organizations in the state budget. And so our, uh, our request of the legislature for an increase includes um, increasing those funds as well. Um, there's a number of proposals in the legislature always, and again this year, sort of regarding how the state allocates uh, portions of the, the uh, tourism fund, which is funded through an occupancy tax on on, um, on Connecticut's hotels. And, uh, and so we have been supportive of, of where the broader arts community is advocating on, on those issues this year as well. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Um, and then from Susie, um, is it possible to glean a temperature read on how leaders are thinking about systems change in parallel to funding current programs? 
through cross-sector collaborative models of care, addressing the social determinants of health, deploying community health workers, et cetera. So I can speak to one data point that we have, and it's not anything specific to social determinants of health or, or specific systems of care, but half of the organizations we surveyed, 49%, said that they were looking at exploring strategic alliance or joint venture preparation or implementation over the next three to six months. So I think what that does show to your point about cross-sector collaborative models of care is that there is a readiness or an inclination to do that work. So. All right, well, that is the rest of the questions in the chat. Um, so, Anne, I will turn it back over to you. Great. Awesome. Well, we really want to thank everyone for plugging in this morning. I think we sort of jammed through the data pretty quickly. Um, but I think in some ways, you know, if I had sort of a closing um, remark to sort of share with the group is to really think about these survey results as a starting point for conversations. So as leaders in your collective field, sectors and regions, coming around data like this and really reflecting on what does this mean for you individually as an organization, but really what can you do together? Um, so where you have common challenges, where you see common opportunities, what is sort of collectively choosing issues to pursue, choosing to make investments collectively, if I think about our philanthropic partners that are here on the line, you know, this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, it is very clear to all of us that the environment is not going to stay the same. Um, and if there's not one challenge on the horizon, there's a different challenge. And so the more that we can use data and information to support our decision-making and to support our ability to come together to take collective action, and whether that's advocacy action, whether it's capacity building, or whether it's really just supporting each other as leaders, um, the NS staff and the nonprofit sector. We really encourage you to use this information um, as a way to start conversations. I'd like to again express thanks to our philanthropic partners that brought this year's survey to fruition um, and to the Alliance for being a great partner. Brunilda, I'll hand it over to you for some closing thoughts before we close out. Um, I'll keep it really brief and short, but uh, one thanks that I'd like to give out that hasn't been mentioned is thank you to Fio. <laughs> um, you guys do really excellent work from the survey uh, development to analysis and presentation. We really appreciate everything that you've done to support this project. So thank you for all of your hard work. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. And again, thank you just so much for all of you being on the line with us. Um, I see great thanks in the chat. Thanks so much. We hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Enjoy the oncoming spring um, and keep in touch with us. Thank you so much, everyone.